Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. It's an online therapeutic resource that will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, all from the comfort of your home. People often forget that mental health is just as important as physical health. I know I do. To get started, head to betterhelp.com slash cinemasins, answer a few questions about your state of mind, and before you know it, you'll be matched with a therapist who will work with you. Connect with a therapist in a safe and secure online environment. And no, this isn't self-help. This is a real connection with an actual human being. And yeah, you also get 10% off your first month when you click that link below. Now, on to the show. Comcast. Movie opens up on Core's product placement that is so aggressive, I think I just became intoxicated watching it. This movie is set the same year Michael Myers came back home. You have to wonder if Michael read the newspaper articles about the grabber in Denver and thought, f***ing amateur. Crowding the plate! Look at this kid's feet! He's on the edge of the batter's box! I'm gonna have the editors run this pitch over and over while I narrate the sin, because this pitch is off. It's almost certainly CGI. And it has big league movement right to left. What the f***? Unless this is some kind of Rookie of the Year prequel, I'm calling bull on this pitch. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it too much, Finny. Once you get to pitch in a city that's not a mile above sea level and doesn't have to have a humidor set at 70 degrees and 50% humidity, those Bruce Riamato home runs will turn into simple pop-ups. So, the sin, as always, is having to play baseball in Denver. Man, your arm is mint. I mean, maybe? But Finney had allowed two runners to reach base before Bruce came up to bat. These are some of the freakiest opening credits since seven. The vintage cornflakes box is on point, but the sin here is for the casual cereal spillage. You think you can slurp that a little louder? Just once I want Jeremy Davies to play the super ordinary guy that works at the grocery store as a produce manager and collects vintage glass baby bottles and has a girlfriend named Mary Beth or Cindy. You're the best! Oh well! Nothing ever- <laughs> Kids. Oh, why's that coming? Penny, he beat I you know when I was there. He's got empathy for the boy that kicked his ass. Can this protagonist get any more perfect? Does he volunteer at the soup kitchen? Did he donate all his clothes to the thrift store so his mom had to buy him new clothes? The surface area is called the crust. No, the surface area is called the topping. Unless he's not talking about pizza, but he's a teacher. Why would he not be talking about pizza? He doesn't explain it right, not like you. Normalize the biggest bullies defending the nerds because they get study help from them. Yeah, I took him down because obviously I'm the grabber, you dumb f***ing fart knockers. When? <laughs> Sometimes my dreams are right. She's right, obviously, because this is a movie. But what would you say to this if you were one of the cops in the room? He turns one lamp off that leaves the rest on as well as the raging fire. F you, he did not keep that rocket between his fingers all night long. You drop that and I will beat your ass to what is this all? Hmm, he's an awful, terrible, abusive father. He's evil. But this is a long-running horror trope that I think we need to confront. Not every horror movie needs its hero to be confronting past demons when it confronts the movie's big bad. Sometimes a kid can have a good upbringing and still face evil and come out on top. And yes, horror is a genre is one that is very helpful to people who have past trauma and helps them heal, and that's amazing. But why are so many dads in horror films so f***ing evil? Do demons and ghosts just ignore people who get hugs from their dad and have a great family? That means you do not hear things that are not there. You do not see things that are not there. You're not your f***ing khakis. You're the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. The kids are watching Davy and Goliath on TV. Subtlest, my name is not the black phone. Where is Robin walking? The warehouse district? Why would the grabber be back here? Also, creepy masked guy gets out of a black van and this kid just keeps walking. Like, he doesn't even flinch. And I know they went out of their way to show he was a badass, but I think even Bruce Lee would hesitate a bit seeing this kind of person suddenly step out of a van. This feels like they planned this meeting on Craigslist so he could sell the grabber his 8-track collection. If you could help me have a dream or two and just see something that could help the police or me or anyone find him, I would follow you forever. Bargaining with Jesus. <laughs> I saw a lot of f***ing fights in school when I was growing up. I saw a lot of volatile and unpredictable behavior. I never saw someone win a fight and then kick his opponent's sister in the head in front of a bunch of witnesses. So again, I say, should we not confront the horror genre's obsession with putting fictional kids through this kind of over-the-top torture? I get that horror helps people work through their trauma, but god f***ing damn. Gwenny in this movie has been beaten by her own father and now kicked in the head by the older bullies who hate her brother, and this is f***ed up. Yeah! This is the kid that will go on to be abducted. And these kicks definitely resulted in a burst spleen, an impacted colon, or a dislodged liver. You cannot kick a person in the stomach 18 times without impacting their internal organs. The cut to a frog dissection scene is more than heavy-handed. It's masturbatory. Everybody's talking about it. Finding out the entire school is talking about your humiliation, and yes, this is me, the narrator, speaking from historical experience. 
After five kidnappings in this one area, I'm not really understanding why any kid is allowed to walk anywhere alone. I guess the biggest sin of this movie is the grabber doing these abductions in broad daylight in populous neighborhoods while driving a recognizable vehicle and showing his face. But also, the second biggest sin is Finney being naive and trusting enough to fall for this after the first 25 minutes of the movie showed us that Finney was an exceptionally smart kid. But I'm not gonna hurt you anymore. Unbelievable promises. It takes 30 minutes for the black phone to black phone. So here, the caption writer just, what, decided on their own that behind this non-moving mask, the grabber must have been smirking? What the f*** is going on here? Deaf people want to know. He obviously could be smirking right now, and maybe that's in the script for some reason, even though he's masked. But even the non-deaf viewer does not know what facial expression he's making under the mask. So this is the weird case of giving too much information in the captions. F*** With the door shut. No one can hear anything down here. I soundproofed it myself. But for some reason, just left a phone down here. Even if it's not connected, why leave it? it? Makes no sense. You're just asking for dead children to start helping out your present victims when you overlook things like this. You're the one who killed the others. Bruce. Robin. Bat phone. Being bad at jumping. Hello? No one answers Finney here, even though the ghost kids have no issue talking to him after this. So why did they not answer on this phone call? Did they think we needed a phone call before the grabber gives the bullshit static energy reasoning to make us question whether or not these are ghosts using the phone? Because we know there's going to be ghosts using the phone. Came to a goddamn ghost movie called The Black Phone. We know the phone factors into this shit. We don't need an early phone tease to get us interested. We're here because we're already interested. If you weren't going to feed me, why'd you even come down here? Just to look at you. Okay, fine. Movie can take its sin off for Ethan Hawke's performance and get on with it. <sighs> what is it with all these stages of the phone calls? First we had the none of the ghosts say shit phone call. Now we have the phone call where one of the ghost kids chooses to scare the shit out of Finney with a creepy voice instead of trying to keep him on the phone. Don't hang up. Then how about you start with something other than a shitty Gollum impression of the kid's name like you did on the last phone call, asshole. These f***ing ghost kids. Who is this? I don't remember my name. But you remember Finney's? Not to mention, you're about to repeat dialogue from the beginning of the film, so why do you keep that memory but lose the memory of who you are when you become a ghost? Your arm is a mint. You almost had me. Third or fourth time, the caller said these lines, and it's starting to feel like padding the runtime. There's a dirt section of the floor in the hallway where the tile is loose. Sweet! Why did you waste so much time repeating a real-life dialogue exchange before mentioning this? No one will be seated while we watch all of Bruce's childhood. She's dreaming about her brother having been kidnapped, so she goes bike riding at night? This is not a smart decision. Mr. Grabber, please don't pay attention to this random rug I put down here. I just thought the place could use some sparkling up. Hello? Don't go upstairs. Why not? It's a trap. And thankfully, you were distracted by the ringing of the phone and chose to pick it up instead of continuing to open the door. Sure, Bruce could have explained this trap business to you when he called earlier, but we're trying to set a mood, Finny. Who are you? I don't remember. But you remembered enough to know you weren't Bruce when Finney asked. Also, I meant to tell you, if he tries to give you eggs, do not eat them. Sh I tore a long cable loose from down there. I kept it hidden. What am I supposed to do with that? Instead of telling you exactly where the wire is while I'm on the phone with you, I will perform this bottle trick and hopefully you will follow along. What is he even trying to do here? Throw the cable through one of the openings in the bars and then wait for the cable to come to life and slither back down to him like a snake? <laughs> I mean, this plan in the end doesn't work, but he's able to get the wire to go straight up the rug and out the other end, and that is some bullshit. Also, why did the grabber leave all these rugs down here in the first place? That well, makes about as much sense as leaving the phone on the wall. Instead of running the cable through this roll of carpet, why didn't he put all the rolls of carpet here and just climb up? I loved mom. Uh I loved her too. I mean, I loved her the way she was. This movie doesn't get everything right, but it deals with grief and parenting in an interesting and more complicated way than most horror movies, or movies in general, would dare to touch. This scene is a great example of that. The fact that Terrence is believing in Gwen and taking her out to look for Finney based on what she saw in her dreams is great. The fact that he's most likely driving around very drunk right now is not as great. We find out later that Gwenny's search and the ensuing shot of the police knocking on the correct door have no connection. 
But the way it's cut together sure seems to imply that the police knocked on a door because a little girl had a vision. Listen, he has to be able to grab these kids and get them back to his place very quickly. True crime addicts. However, they got there, the police showed up at the actual house where Finney is being held, and there's a totally not the grabber person living there. But the sin is that the cop noticed the cocaine, but helped dude cover it up, instead of using it as an excuse to search the house further, which would lead to the discovery of the Finney basement. Maybe Finney has a way to know when the grabber is at home and might come down. Not sure how, but even if he does, why would he risk leaving this hole exposed where he couldn't get to it in time to cover up if the door opened? Tell him on. For what it's worth, if I'm Penny, I'm still eating those floor eggs later after the grabber leaves. Hello? Bruce? Billy? Paperboy? Now that they've established the communication with Finney, they're still doing these hang-up calls? What the f*** is up with these ghost kids? How has Max never walked in on his sometimes topless brother sitting in the kitchen wearing a mask and holding a belt? Considering how cautious the grabber is being with bringing food and whatnot, this setup, while super creepy and memorable as a scene from a horror film, seems extremely risky. It doesn't make a lot of sense. The grabber momentarily falls asleep waiting for Finney to walk upstairs, and is he a moron? If he's not playing your game right, then wait an hour or so, and then go back down and lock the basement door and go to bed. Also, ever since Finney just lodged the bars from the window, we've never seen that addressed. Not by the grabber, not by Finney. We haven't even been shown that window again since to find out if the bars were put back. It's almost like some footage was shot but edited out that might have explained this mystery. Cleaning up after your kidnapper. Why didn't the grabber go through Finney's pockets to find and confiscate any stabby things, such as this rocket that already cut grabber's hand and apparently doubles as a f***ing flashlight? So now, in addition to getting phone calls from dead kids, Finney is now seeing dead kids here in this basement. Maybe I shouldn't be asking. I mean, I'm sure they're gonna explain all this eventually. It's all a little hazy, but I imagine you know all our names. Are you guys connected in the afterlife? Are you all together in the grabber's victim's village? Oh, and also, what the f***? Then he leaves his rocket ship flashlight on long after he's done using it, draining its batteries of power, I assume will end up being crucial down the road. You spent so many years invisible, and then every kid in the state knows your name. How the f*** can you square this comment with the fact that you just said you didn't know your own name, like all the other ghost callers didn't know their names? You spent so many years invisible, and that every kid in the state knows your name is an excellent line that just doesn't make much sense here. How is it even possible to lament everyone knowing your name when you don't even know your own name? Do I just... Home? There's a combination lock on the inside of the storm door. Jesus, tap dancing Christ on a phone call ex machina. 23317? If you say so. What is it? 23317 or 23317 or 23317? Why did the kid write the combination down like this so it would be confusing? Also, why did the grabber continue to use the paper boy's lock for the other boys? The paper boy was the only one who truly had a fighting chance of getting out unheard. Two things, the grabber's unique ability to sleep in this f***ing mask, but also his ability to hold on to the weapon in his right hand despite being asleep. Also, both this movie's protagonist and antagonist have been shown to be able to sleep through the night without losing grip of a thing they are holding. What does it mean? But also, Grabber has an entire ass brother that lives here who's obsessed with the Grabber, and I guess he's the soundest sleeper ever? Grabby can just sleep here in the kitchen with the mask on and the basement door open? <laughs> a dog that has been trained to bark at the sound of a combination lock opening, but not at someone walking past the door. Finney, running at full speed, somehow only gets a block or so away from the house in the time it takes the Grabber to get to his van, start it up, and pull out of the driveway. I'm not sure if I'm sinning the illogical time frame or that Finney is way too slow for a kid his age. You say one word, and I will gut you like a pig right here in the street and strangle you with your own intestines. But after you cut out my guts, won't I already be dead? Thereby making the intestine strangling a redundant act? Nighty night, naughty boy. I'm calling bullshit on knowing ahead of time that your punch will knock someone out. Sure, some punches do knock people out, but no one knows ahead of time that this will occur. There's an alternate version of this movie where he says, Nighty night, naughty boy, and then his punch does not knock the kid out. So he has to say, Nighty night, naughty boy, again, and punch him again. What was all that noise I heard? Samson was barking at something. It's nothing. Go back to bed, Max. This works. Jesus, what the f***? <laughs> I ask you for help when you give me these clues that don't mean anything. This movie is dangerously close to plagiarizing my own upbringing. Pinball. Not that it's not awesome. The sin is because it's maddening. The defecator. I don't know much about North Denver gas stations in 1978, but I'm gonna guess most didn't carry this many back issues of Starlog. At this point, we see the bully kid's perspective of the conversation he just had with Finney, but he's dead. So this is just a vision Gwynny is having about him showing her the house. So my question is, did her vision impact the call Finney had with the ghost? Or did the conversation with the ghost somehow become part of her vision? Also, whoever or whatever is controlling these phone calls and visions is really benevolent. Like, so benevolent as to be kind of cheating. Never mind. I, 
I just remember they're going to explain all this before the movie's over. Have you tried stacking the garbage to reach the window? Stop stealing my lines, ghost. What did you do? I'm getting to that f***ing wad. Interrupting a ghost. <laughs> hmm, that's odd. I don't remember the realtor ever saying anything about ghost scream earthquakes. I don't think the freezer door is likely to be open from the inside regardless, but why didn't he bash at it with the lid from the toilet tank he used to break through the wall instead of immediately going shoulder? Hey, Finn. What's happening? And somehow Robin still knows who he is, but all the other ghosts did not. Today is the day you stop taking sh from anybody. Man, this pep talk is awesome. Why didn't he call away before now? He even said he's been here the whole time. What weapon? The one in your hand. This is information that would have been helpful to him yesterday! I'm sure it's gonna be the right move and end up working, but why is Robin teaching Finney to lunge forward and then back before attacking? Did he try this himself and it came close to working? Does he have intel suggesting the grabber is susceptible to feints and jukes by little boys? Also, why not tell him to tie the cord around the receiver and swing that dirt-filled bitch around like a meteor hammer? This was the last call, Finn. Saw you from here on out. And we all got to talk to you individually to give you one vital piece of information each to help you survive, because that's how being a ghost works. Please, dear Jesus, please, please. Still alive, but I'm barely breathing. Just praying to a God that I don't believe in. Hello, Officer Stupid? This is the little sister of one of the kids the grabber took, and I just had a dream about what house he is in, and we have to act now, because the same dream also said this was his last day alive. Detective Wright, please. Movie then cuts away before we get to hear the police laughing on the other end of the phone after she tells her story. Oh, Max has just figured everything out. Hey, you know what might have been cool? Us spending more time with Max than just one scene with the cops where the movie made him look crazy. What kind of evidence is he collecting? Is he going out and investigating on his own? This moment might have a bit more weight if he was a bigger presence in the film. Holy f***ing sh Stop the goddamn ride, I want to get off and rant. These cops are not only believing a nine-year-old girl who says she had a vision about where the grabber's house is, they are racing to follow that lead down. And this is just not how police work works. Try this, send your elementary school age child to the local PD and have her tell them that she's had a vision there were murder victims buried in your least favorite neighbor's backyard. Report back to me when the cops are actively digging up their yard based on that intel. No, keep that, it's stabby. Hey, you wanna know the story about how I found you, man? Max thinks they have time for this. F Max. Is this the house? Yes! Are you sure? Is this actually happening? Look what you made me do. Oh my god, grabber is a Swifty! Open up! Police! We have no legal cause to be here! I honestly think the real horror in this movie is the complete and utter lack of protocol and ethics employed by these police. Holy Christ. So ultimately, Robin's lunge, step back, and then attack move ends up working multiple times in this climax. It's like defeating Glass Joe and punch out. Why is he freaking out when the top part of his mask is taken off? Finney had already seen the top part of his face earlier. It's the missing kids. This is where he buries them. No, it's mounds of dirt. Do some police work for a change. As Gwenny sees Finney, this music is good and reminds me of Time from Inception. And I can't play this music or Time from Inception, but I can sing Time from Inception. I'm so sorry. Wow, the kidnapping ordeal cured his alcoholism and that cured his abusiveness. Hi, Finney. I'm a Finn. Now that I've killed a man and eaten dirty floor eggs, it's time to shed those childhood nicknames. I just got out of a six-year relationship, okay? That should help explain why. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. No matter what kind of day, week, month, or even year you're having, BetterHelp can, well, help. Once you get started, you can send messages to your therapist anytime, check out information that's relevant to your needs, and book your next appointment all on the same page. Does it get any better than that? If you're feeling like you need to speak to someone or you just need a mental health check-in, BetterHelp is an amazing online resource that allows you to do just that. And you don't even have to leave the house to do it. It takes about as much effort as watching a YouTube video to start your connection to BetterHelp. And hey, we can all watch YouTube, right? I mean, you're all the way at the end of this video. You get bonus points. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change therapists if needed. Head to betterhelp.com slash cinemasins to answer a few questions and get paired up with a therapist within 48 hours. Get a whole 10% off your first month by clicking that link. Join over 2 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash cinemasins. <laughs> Jesus, 
I know you know what I'm going to ask. Why are you whispering? They can't hear you. Hello? Do you want to die tonight, Cece? Dug me a hole. Don't go upstairs. Why not? It's a trap! Hello? I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. Two, three, three, one, seven. Two, three, three, one, seven. We are three, nine, two, K. <laughs> Cocaine's a hell of a drug.